time before we get into this. And Lord, thank you again for this day, and thank you for your word, Lord. For your word leads us to eternal life, carries us through this world, and molds us and shapes us by the power of your spirit and by the life of your son, death, burial, and resurrection, in which we can have eternal life. And we want to thank you in your son's precious name. Amen. All right. So our text was, you know, from uh, Colossians, and we started in verse 9. But I just want to give you a couple nuts and bolts going on here uh, of what, where, how, and why. Uh, this, this epistle would have been written by the Apostle Paul, okay? And, uh, and the Apostle Paul never made it to Colossae, where this letter was written. Paul may have been the author, but Epaphras was in Ephesus and went back to Colossae. He started the church, shared the gospel, started the church, and joyously people came to a true saving faith in Jesus Christ. And that's the part from one through eight. If you had to squeeze it all down, that's what it is. Like I said, the Apostle Paul never visited, but yet he loved these people to point them to the truth, to give them instructions to live, and to continue on till death. Or the rapture of the church. We don't know what when that's going to happen, but that's a whole different subject. So we're going to, like I said, we started at nine. And I'm going to kind of work through this again, read it and work through it, okay? And it was for this reason. What reason? Because these people came to a true saving faith in Jesus Christ. Not an imaginary, but a true one. You know, since the day that Paul and Timothy, I'm sorry, yeah, Paul heard of it. They didn't stop cease praying for them. Now, I want to make a little side note here. This is something we need to do for each other other also not to cease praying for each other because you know we don't we just want to lift each other up in prayer to the Lord okay and he knows how to deal with this each and every one of us and that we be filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding and we need the knowledge of his will why because left to ourselves we're not going to get it and what I mean by knowledge is not not just an imaginary thought of, oh, well, God will have me do that. Well, that's not what that's saying. The knowledge of his will is written in the book. Of these 66 books contained in one here in the Bible. We just need to do a little work and figure out what pleases our Lord. And that we would have understanding. And there's a reason why the Apostle Paul's talking about this, speaking to our heart first. Because that way, if we're transformed from the inside we will start to act on it on the outside in our daily life, all right? Because you, you, can't, you can't do it from the outside. There has to be something miraculous happening in every soul, and you must be born again. You're not gonna, you're not gonna be a spiritually dead person worshiping God. You have to be born again. All right. Um, I know as I leak through my notes here, as I'm going through, I, I just want to, there's a couple definitions I want to read here as we get to it a little closer to really define the terms here, but we're not there yet. Uh, and so that we will walk. What does walk mean in the Bible? You know, to walk means is to live our lives accordingly. That's why he wanted us to have understanding and wisdom in, of the true knowledge of God that we would live it. Time, treasures, talents in our tongues. The tongue's the hardest one. I mean, you know, my jokes are pretty corny. I mean, let's be real. But even, even our tongues need to glorify God and help build each other up. Right? Well, what good it would be if somebody had a, a spiritual problem and I says, well, you know, uh, I think if you juggled three squirrels facing the southwest, and you, uh, and you had a chipmunk run up your left leg. Well, that ain't going to do you no good. But if you had trouble, I says, well, okay, let's go to God's word and let's see what it says. Let's pray for each other. Let me pray for you, and we're going to see what God's word says. Then we apply it from there on. But to walk, that definition means regulate one's life 
or to conduct oneself as we walk or live our time on this earth. Okay? So there has to be a General, there has to be something happen after one's born again. Has to be. The only exception I can think of is a thief on the cross or somebody that died right there. That, but I guarantee you if that thief would have come down, he would have started living his life and conducting it wisely. Um, now in verse 10, it says, In a manner worthy of the Lord, bearing fruit in every good work, increasing in the knowledge of God. And that as we bear fruit, that it would be fruit that's pleasing to the eye of God. Is that a decent way to put it to where it's understandable? To where we don't want to be a rotten chunk of uh, apple hanging from the tree. We've got to have some good fruit bearing about our life. And the fruit we find in Galatians, I didn't write it down, but that's just a freebie, is that we need to be bearing these kinds of fruits, which he's going to touch on here in just a little bit too. So... And are we going to know everything about God? No. He's too grand and glorious. But what's written in the Word, we're to do our best to find out. With our, with our capacity, he's given us. And then we're to be strengthened with all power according to his glorious might. This is something that God works within the soul. I mean, yeah, we're to be faithful. We're to walk and we're to sub, submit and obey I'm going to make a controversial term here as what our Lord and Savior, and if he's our Lord and Savior, that means he's our king. And, uh, and with that kind of uh, uh, governmental rule, the king's got the final say-so. We're his loyal subjects, and we want to be a loving, loyal subject. This is what we need to ask God to help us with. Okay? we got to. Because we don't want to be a rebellious subject. What happens to them? <laughs> it ain't good. Usually they get their head cut off back, you know, on an earthly kingdom. But as, a, but as a subject not being faithful to the Lord, there's a chance you may not be saved. And you'll be a rebellious, unfaithful servant, which is thrown out with weeping and gnashing of teeth. But we're going to move on here. And that we as mature, redeemed people from the kingdom of Satan, live in a changed life steadfastly. Now, let me flip over here. We're, uh, what verse are we? Steadfastness. We're in verse 11. These are the three things I wanted, to, I wanted to read here. For the attaining of all steadfastness. And steadfastness means constancy, endurance. All right, my son, he, can, he runs marathons or, you know, 5Ks. All right, look, I, I, don't, I might run to get a drink of water if I need it. That's all the farther it's going to go. Okay, but this means a constant, steady battle moving forward, all right? Uh, it says the characteristics of a man who is unswerved from, being from his deliberate purpose and his loyalty to faith and piety by even the greatest trials and sufferings, all right, that no matter what, when you're born again, you've received this grace, and you're now living by faith. God will help you steadfastly get through anything this life has to offer. And we're going we're gonna to have that focus here of being steadfast, of being heavenward. And it's hard from time to time. I'm not going to say it's not. You know, I fail miserably time to time and time to time and time. But yet my focus is upward. You know, it's like, okay, Lord, I'm struggling here. I'll just lay my... I'm, I'm having trouble here, Lord. I, I want to react not in your way, but then he encourages me through his word to just be steadfast and just get through. He'll get me through, and he'll get you through too. And then we get with patience and joy. Oh, that's a tough one. That definition, like I said, these are things that we need to know. Um... Long passion, an example, waiting sufficient time before expressing anger. There is a time to express anger, okay? I'm not saying uncontrolled anger. There's a time to where if there's a constant wrong being done, you're going to have to address it, okay? Uh, let's see where... Uh, this is used of God himself, hence the fruit of the Spirit, long-tempered, 
a counterpart to short-tempered. You've got long-tempered and short-tempered. Long-tempered will produce correct anger. Short-tempered is personal reaction, and the Lord tells us to turn the other cheek on these personal, uh, on the personal attacks we face upon ourselves. Okay. Now, if somebody's attacking y'all, I'm not going to stand back and go, "Oh, well, you know, I'm just going to be long-tempered." No. And also protect you guys. Also, I mean, I'm not the pastor. I mean, Pastor Bruce is. But what I'm saying is, if somebody's going to do you physical harm, something's got to happen. It needs to be pretty quick. What I'm talking is being patient with a person that becomes born again. To where these things, because we all don't go from uh, babyhood to maturity within a blink of an eye. There is a process to where the Lord lovingly and patiently works with each and, each and every one of us at whatever stage we're in. Now here's one that uh, I've been having to relearn and learn and and get drilled back in, joyously giving thanks to God. This is a calm delight. That this understanding God's will, living our complete, living in our complete lives, being strengthened that no matter what trials come in life, we know that God knows, and as maturity keeps going, this can be done with joy, giving thanks to God. So let me give you a let me give you a uh, a cliff note, I guess, that even when trials and tribulations come through life, we can joyously face the Lord and know that He's got things in control. These things are happening for a particular reason we may know and may not know, but yet it is for our good, His glory, and with an ultimate of us enjoying the Lord forever. There is a process why these things happen. Uh, if you want, I would read like Fox's Book of Martyrs, people who joyously faced a trial, giving God glory. Uh, there are people like Johnny Erickson Tata today, her trials, and she gives God glory. There's a whole plethora of people out there. And no, we're not going to be exactly like them. And I'm not saying that you lose a loved one, that it that you're going to be laughing the whole time. You're going to cry because you miss them. But yet, you know, deep down, joy, that it's for our good, God's glory, and for us to enjoy Him fully forever, which ought to be our new focus in life. Now, it says He qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints of light. That word qualified, it means to be sufficient, render fit for heaven, okay? To equip one with adequate power to perform the duties of one. A cross reference is 2 Corinthians 3 6, if a person wants to read it sometime. Uh, but that whatever gift God gives us and whatever trial, He equips us to go through it, being faithful for Him. <clears throat> Excuse me. And that eventually we will have an eternal portion in the kingdom of heaven. Have you ever pondered that just for a bit? But we're not going to get there on our own. But God renders us fit. And he gives us a portion of heaven. Now, I don't know exactly what that looks like. I, I, I don't have no idea. But I know there will be no more sin. There will be no more pain. There'll be no more suffering. There'll be no more tears. He gives us a portion of that. Could it be maybe in the millennial kingdom to where we may have a portion of something we're to do for him? Our life is now preparing us for eternity. Now what that full eternal state looks like, I don't fully know. We're not going to be laying there like babies on a fluffy cloud strumming a harp or... I'd rather do a banjo. But, you know, it's not going to be that way. It, it'll be to where we can worship him, first and foremost. We're going to be doing things, too. If we have to work, it's not going to be like work here to where we're fizzled out. I know I'm going off just a little bit, 
but just bear with me. But that portion in heaven is going to be permanent, sin-free. It will be joyful if we have to work, whatever that work, whatever it is. I, I'm not sure what it is, but whatever we do, it will be joyful. See, we're attached to these, you know, these bodies right now where sin, suffering, and pain come about. And it's hard to get out of bed and or you fall down, it hurts, to whatever. But that ain't going to be so in heaven. That's right. Because we're going to have a portion in that and it's secured. It's not a maybe. And when you truly throw yourself at the feet of the Savior and he saves you, it's secured no matter what Satan has to say and whispers in our ears. Okay? Keep that in mind. He's a defeated foe. He's going to try to drag as many people to hell with him as he can. I want to see people saved. We may struggle through this. There's the freebie for today. We may struggle through this life, and yeah, we may sin. But my question is, is our hearts facing up to heaven and say, Lord, I'm sorry, and if I do something wrong, I'll make it right to believer, non-believer, whoever? Am I appreciative of that time when I get to go to heaven? Looking forward to that. You know, and this is, takes, this is a transformation that has to happen. And this is why the Apostle Paul's writing. He never sees these people face to face, yet he knows they're saved. Just due to the report from Epaphras. And that's what we, I want to see people, okay, I'll lay, I want to see people saved around here truly. There's a lot of people think that their good works are going to save them, and it doesn't. And I'm starting to flash ahead to the very end. Why not? People think if they perform certain rites, rituals, and such as that, they're saved, and it's not so. People may think, like I did years ago, I said the prayer. I had no love for the Savior. I wasn't saved years ago. It's only been in my 30s when the Lord opened my eyes to what kind of person I really was, and I was helpless, dead in my sins and trespasses. There's other people who think that you're going to become a god. It's not so. It's not in the Bible. That's false idol worship, and it ends up worshiping, worshiping yourself. So, it, And then we're going to come up to the real crux of the gospel. This is just a prelude. And what I've got to say here at the end ain't going to take very long. But even through these trials, people arguing with you, saying that their good works saved them and stuff like that, yeah, it's just there's a reason for it to where I can joyously look at God and say thank you because I walked through that earlier. Because if you'd have seen a good old boy, my picture and name would have been in the dictionary around this area. But I wasn't a good old boy. I was a, a pretty smelly rascal. Uh, but we come to the to the pinnacle here of our text. And then we'll flash forward a little bit farther. Because from 15 to 19 is a whole other teaching in and of itself. But it's, he rescued us from the domain of darkness. And transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. In whom we have redemption through his blood for the forgiveness of sins. The older translations would have had through his blood. And I think this newer translation lost it. And you'll see why I say through his blood, because we're going to flash forward to 20. And this is where the freebie and the notes are probably going to stop here for just a minute. He rescued us from what? The domain of darkness, meaning that we were once a part of the kingdom of Satan. You're either saved or you're not saved. You're either a believer or not a believer. You're, you start off, every single individual that is born from the time of Adam on, except for Jesus Christ, is part of this dominion. But who rescues us? God rescues us. And from what? It's the domain of darkness. Now look at the contrast we're going to have coming up here. And he transferred us. I mean, have you taken money from one account to another? Does that money jump over automatically? I mean, I know you got automatic withdrawal, but that's not what I'm talking about. 
I'm talking about for the most part, if I want cash, yeah, I may have to go to an ATM or a bank. It doesn't just jump out of the machine when I look at it and I want the money to come. It doesn't work that way. It is transferred from out of one account to something else. It's translated as another term which can be used. Our Bibles are translated from the New Testament from the Greek and translated to English. Someone was in between doing that because the bulk of us don't just read Greek, you know, unless you're trained. But at this point, we're transferred to the kingdom. The sovereign kingdom, actually, is a good definition of it. And sovereign means magic, majestic, chief, supreme, none higher. This domain is going to pass away. All right? Well, let's just be totally blind. And I like how Peter puts it. It's all going to get burned up. To get set up for the millennial kingdom. I got my uh, passage right. But this kingdom of his beloved son. Who is his beloved son? Well, that is Jesus Christ. 100% man, 100% God. The only one that was able to transfer us from the one spot and get us into the kingdom of God. But there's something else. It's for whom, the whom ought to be capitalized, we've got redemption of the forgiveness of our sins. Remember the one phrase I added in there? Through his blood. If you flash back to the old covenant, the bulk of the sacrifices were blood sacrifices. Something had to die for the picture of forgiveness of sins to where when Jesus died and shed his blood, we got the forgiveness of our sins. Okay? Through his blood. I know people say, well, you shouldn't talk about that. We have to. I'm not trying to glamorize all, you know, blood and this and that. But yes, he obediently laid his life down for us to have eternal life, pleasing the Father and securing us for heaven. It's not a maybe deal. This is a done deal. And then we roll through here. We're going to just roll through 20. And it's through Jesus. Reconciling all things to himself, having made peace through the blood of his cross. This is why, because you got an intermediate spot here between, but I just want to focus here on through his blood. Peace through the blood of his cross through Jesus. I say, whether things on earth or things in heaven, doesn't matter. One drop of the blood of Christ can take all sins away. Now, unbelievers, his blood's not going to cover an unbeliever. Okay. It doesn't work that way. And I'm going to lead to how you become a believer here in just a second. And although you were formerly alienated, remember you were in this one domain of darkness and hostile in mind, because we've got to admit, because there was no thoughts of God in our mind. If it was, it was imagination or us as God. And we were engaged in evil deeds. I mean, let's call it for what it was. It was evil for the eyes of God. But yet now he reconciled, I'm going to make it personal, me in his fleshly body through death in order to present me before him holy and blameless and beyond reproach. If indeed you continue in the faith firmly, not an imaginary faith. I'm glad Noah, when he built the ark, didn't use his imagination, but he followed what God had to say because he believed him because God showed grace upon him. Establish steadfast. Remember that steadfastness to where we're going to continue with in this life with our eyes focused to heaven and we're not going to be swerved. We may stumble and get knocked down, but we're going to get back up. And I like how one pastor said it a long time ago. If I fall down, Lord, please let me fall forward. Okay, well, we're moving towards heaven. And we're not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which is Jesus paying for our sins and nothing of us. 
that which the Colossians heard, which we may apply to us today because we've heard the same gospel, which was proclaimed in all creation under heaven and of which I, Paul, was made a minister. So my question is to anybody out there in Facebook world or on a TV screen or even in, in our hearts here today, if somebody's struggling and they don't know, they're a believer in Jesus, am I going to am I going to inherit eternal life or am I going to be cursed to eternal damnation? I mean, I know my words are harsh, but I'm not saying to me. I, this is a straightforward fact. One is you're going to have to come to grips that before the eyes of God, you're a sinner. And you say, well, yeah, so, I mean, everybody else is too. But the fact is, it says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Are you willing to admit that to the Lord, that you're a liar, a thief, an adulterer, a blasphemer, a non-respecter of parents? And you say, well, what do I do? I go, well, you throw yourself at the foot of Jesus Christ. There's no confessional that's going to save you. There's no pastor that's going to save you. There's no priest that's going to save you. There's no pope that's going to save you. There's no juggling of the three squirrels facing southwest with the wind blowing up your left sock. And that's not going to save you. It is through the blood of Jesus Christ. And you need to believe it. You say, well, how do I believe it? Well, this is when we repent and turn unto him. And we submit to him as Lord and Savior. Because without repentance, nobody's going to see the Lord. And God grants repentance. You say, well, that's a work. No, it's not a work. Because when you realize you're defeated and where you're going, you will joyously turn to him and ask for forgiveness. Like the king that had 10,000 sent terms of surrender off to the king with 20,000. That terms of surrender is, what would you have me do? And that's when we give our life to the Lord and follow after him. It's not a work for heaven. This is a natural response to, I'm going to go to hell, and I'm so thankful to that, for the God-man to lay his life down for me to have eternal life. And then we turn because we love him now, because we've now been saved by grace through faith. And then we need to confess Jesus Christ is Lord. Not just Savior. Everybody likes the Savior aspect. And hey, I'm guilty as everybody else. I like the aspect that I had my, uh, my ticket punched where I wouldn't go into hell. And the greatest deep respect is that was true. But the aspect is, is, am I living by faith? Do I believe what the Lord tells me? Do I follow him wholeheartedly? You know, that's the question we need to ask ourselves. Everybody loves, I want to word, I want to try to word this carefully because it can get misconstrued. But I guess the ultimate question is, do we truly believe the Lord Jesus Christ or not? He who has my commandments and keeps him is he it is that loves me. And he that loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself in him. And that's in John chapter 14, verse 21. So there's that aspect of if I believe him, if I said, look, the building's on fire, the only way you're going to make it out is through that door. And if you take every other door other than that one, it means you didn't believe me. But the question is, is, have we gone to the Savior to ask for forgiveness of sins? Because you can repent right now and just ignore God, and that's not going to save you. Because God does not forget nothing. He's not like us. I done forgot what we had back in Sunday school. That's why we need our sins dealt with past, present, and even into our future. And that's something only Jesus Christ did for us about 2,000 years ago. So, so, other than that, we're going to go ahead and pray, and then we're going to sing a song, and then uh, chat for a little bit. Anybody got questions? Let's talk. Okay. If, uh, if I mess something up, you got a question, let's talk. Because I'm not above making mistakes up here either. So, uh, but, and thank you, Lord, again for this day.
And I thank you, Lord, for your word. And I thank you most of all for the one true and living God, Jesus Christ, who lived and died for us and saved us from our sins. And he gives us a new life, prepares us for eternity, and if you're not part of that, you're not going to heaven. And I'm not saying that because I'm better than anybody else. It's because what your word teaches from Genesis to Revelation. It's no work on our own that saves us. Your blood secured us. But Lord, I'm thankful. And whatever you want to use from us, anything, it's all yours. Help us to have that joyful thanks whenever trials and tribulations come and or will come and or we're in, Lord, to where we can look at you with great joy and thank you, Lord. Lord, if somebody doesn't know you today, I pray, Lord, you'd open their eyes, ears, and heart to why they have to have you. And they would come on bended knee, even with their face to the ground, realizing they're in holiness. And asking, forgive them, and they would get to heaven because I truly want to see people saved. I got the big inkling times drawn short only you know the time but you stand back and look at the events they're happening harder and faster it's a warning like you told us about and, and through the gospels that I ask Lord that you would be glorified not us in Christ's name amen